Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Lloyd Jacobs, President of the University of Toledo. The University of Toledo is one of 13 state universities in Ohio and in 2006 became the third largest Ohio public university when it merged with the Medical University of Ohio. Dr. Jacobs and his team is leading the most far-reaching transformation of the university in its 138-year history and has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Jacobs, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Mark, for being here. We're delighted. Welcome. You've had quite a career from being a Marine and serving our country to being a vascular surgeon. You've been a chief operating officer, a faculty member, a dean, a college president. What is it about leading the University of Toledo during this transformational time that inspired you to accept yeah. such a challenge at this point in your career? Well, thanks for asking. If w I were to go back over those various uh, uh, undertakings of which you spoke, they all have some common thread. I have a, a uh, commitment to s serve, if you will. Uh, where exactly that came from, I don't know. But uh, this is a time of great societal change, societal upheaval almost, uh, almost a societal travail, even beyond the uh, current economic circumstances in which we find ourselves as a, uh, as a uh, nation. Uh, there's societal change that is just uh, uh, unprecedented. That's a challenge to me, to provide some stability, to be forward thinking, to lead that, uh, to uh, not be a victim of it, but a leader of it is a great challenge to me, very exciting to me. So that's, well, that's I guess, the, the answer to your question. And we've, we've seen this, this nation change so much in, in 50 or 60 years from having a, a, an economic base that is structurally different, where today services take a much stronger role than m the manufacturing base, which is uh, having a lot of difficulty, um, and we are trying to recapture that manufacturing base. Manufacturing is shifting from uh, technologies uh, such as uh, automobiles to new technologies in automobiles and, and technologies such as solar and, and biotechnology and, and information technologies. A lot of these these uh, changes are knowledge based. There's no question about it, and and one of the things that relate to the challenge of which you spoke is my belief, and uh, it seems to me to be almost incontrovertible that uh, universities play a larger and larger role in society. Uh, uh, currently, in fact, it's my belief that universities provide the societal glue, the coherence and the cohesion that holds our society together. And that's in no small part due to the facts that, that you, uh, some of the things that you just mentioned, we've moved from what was still pretty much an agrarian society when yes. I was young. When at the time when I was in fact an enlisted person in the Marine Corps, we were an agrarian society um, and half and half a, an agrarian society and a mechanically driven manufacturing society. We're now almost at the end, at the period of obsolescence of mechanically driven manufacturing and moving into a very different society. One that is where manufacturing, uh, to the extent it exists, will be driven by knowledge, will be driven by information. It's a very different society, dramatic. What a wonderful time to live. At the same time, what a challenging time to live. Well, picking up on, on your point about manufacturing, it seems almost that manufacturing has become an information technology. We have different ways of encoding knowledge. Now the such knowledge that drives machines is encoded in diodes and computers. So the encoding of knowledge is so much different. But it was so, even then, we thought of it as mechanical, mechanically based engineering, but it was in fact driven by our human knowledge. The, the difference is that we can encode so much more knowledge in such very small packages. That's the big difference, it seems to me. Uh, I think manufacturing, even going back to agrarian times, uh, plows and Jeffersonian plows and so forth, was always based on knowledge and, and human creativity and know-how. It's just that such a dramatic change in the ability to store and to bring knowledge to bear, to retrieve knowledge. So is the distinction in, in the diverse types of knowledge that has to be brought together and the ability to learn new 
skills on a continual basis. Well, I, I think you're right. I think it's important to uh, think, re recognize that in the era that we were speaking of, uh, 50 or so years ago, it was not uncommon for a person to work in the same place, the same job, the same farm mm -hmm. for one's entire life. Now the average uh, person has uh, 10 or 12 or 13 jobs during a lifetime. The single most important uh, thing that we teach in universities these days is not knowledge base, but a ability to think and retool oneself and to uh, uh, deal with transitions. So it's a very different world. You're certainly right about that. And this university has bridged both worlds, going back 138 years and the various transformations that the university has, has undertaken. Uh, you have a, an institution that is in a, a major urban uh, environment. Uh, you draw uh, students from uh, across the state and across the world. And now you're sitting there in a position in which you are going to affect, over the years, thousands, tens of thousands yes. of, uh, of young people. That is uh, a considerable responsibility. How are you uh, facing that challenge of creating mm -hmm. a new knowledge base for, uh, for youth and for mm -hmm. adults? Well, from a temporal perspective, you're quite right. The 50 or so years of which I spoke are uh, one half of the uh, history of our, arts and, uh, our College of Arts and Science. We've just celebrated the 100th year anniversary. So we have lived, this as a university, as an institution, we have lived across this uh, huge societal uh, uh, transition. You're, you're, you're certainly correct about that. Interestingly, if you look on the web, if you Google the phrase Rust Belt, you are brought to at least one website where there's a sort of red swoosh along the right. underside, the uh, uh, south edge of the Great Lakes. And Toledo, Ohio is perfectly exactly in the center of the Rust Belt. We are quintessentially manufacturing. Within a few miles of where we live is, within a few miles of where we're currently sitting, is some of the world's greatest industrial strength. However, that has all changed, as you imply by your questions in our, in our conversation. And what was once the world's great strength and our country's great strength is now becoming rapidly becoming obsolete or changing dramatically. The University of Toledo has been for the last several years uh, very aware of that, very cognizant of the need to change rapidly. Uh, we have enunciated to one another that as the world changes outside of us, if we don't change inside the university, we become less and less relevant every day. If we manage to change inside the university at the pace of change outside, we can keep up. Right. Uh, but relevance of this university is uh, related to our ability to adjust to the external change. And so we've been consciously aware of that, consciously working to do that. And the, and the regents um, and, and the leadership of this university is, is driving now toward a transformation of the university itself, starting before the 2006 merger, but certainly that 2006 merger. It was a tremendous event. And I would say that you're quite right that w there was an awareness of where we were going and some really visionary forward thinking by my predecessor and some of his predecessors. Yes. At the same time, that moment uh, catalyzed our understanding of the need for change in a very dramatic way. Uh, sometimes I think of a metaphor of uh, two subatomic particles coming together for a larger one with the emission of huge amounts of energy. And to some extent that metaphor holds true here. We experienced a tremendous outpouring, if you will, of creative energy from that merger. And uh, to a fair degree have channeled it constructively uh, and uh, uh, thought a lot and spoken a lot about uh, changing in a direction that will make us continuously relevant to the rest of the world. So integration between the two institutions, uh, between two large institutions in particular, is a challenge. Could you describe some of the, uh, the steps that you have taken? and, and the, te the steps that you wish to take to continue that integration process? Well, everyone who's done corporate or other mergers knows that uh, this is a difficult job. And most yeah. fail. And most fail. And many uh, merged uh, universities have failed, as well as merged corporations, of course. And it's almost a truism to recognize that they fail because of cultural issues. Yes. So I will speak about that. What initially, of course, we 
uh, were asked by the uh, government. The, we're both the state institutions, and at a point, the former governor was signed his name to a document, and that was that. They've, his work was over. Right. And he just sort of said, okay, here, <laughs> you have, you're a single university. If it's, if it's successful, it's because of and the signature. And that was <laughs> the end of that. And uh, f from the perspective of our own city and u two universities, first of all, there's a huge amount of uh, logistic work. Uh, transportation between the two. Yeah. Uh, we ended up with two CFOs, two chief financial officers, two heads of uh, human resources, two heads of construction and facilities, sorting through that. Two uh, nursing school programs, two health science and human services uh, deans. Two faculties, two, two student bodies, two series sorting of... Sorting through all of those personnel issues maybe was uh, the, the job of the first year. From that time till now, and we're still not 100% finished with it, we had to amalgamate all the policies which have, of two different universities, mm -hmm. personnel policies, academic policies, policies having to do with uh, 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 fire alarms, for heaven's sake. It's just an amazing chunk of work. Here's a, almost uh, in jest, I would uh, mention to you, we had two police forces. Yes. And it turns out that there's a, a law in Ohio that says that everybody on one on a police force has to carry the same weapon. So of course these had two different weapons and we had to have a lot of discussion about which, <laughs> right? It, that sort of detail. Uh, but then, uh, uh, many months later, almost without my asking or prompting, the two alumni associations emerged. Tremendously uh, uh, helpful very valuable, good leadership that, as I say, needed, didn't need to uh, prompting from me. About a year later, uh, we, of course, had two foundations, mm -hmm. uh, and that took a little prompting. There came a time that I had to gather the leadership, the two foundations, and said, how are we going to do this? And, uh, and But we did it, and uh, that was a little, took a little more effort, if you will, a little bit more uh, negotiating, but that happened, I think, uh, uh, a year and a, some months after the official merger of the two institutions. Interestingly enough, we had two faculty senates, of course, mm -hmm. and the two faculty senates, frankly, were the most difficult, took the longest to uh, come to a merged uh, faculty senate. So those are some of the issues. They illustrate, that sequence illustrates, it seems to me, this issue of culture. The faculty senates were more uh, repositories of culture than were the, some of the others. So there were some operational challenges. There were operational and then there were cultural challenges, challenges and then cultural challenges. And, and, and I would say that the cultural challenges, Mark, if, uh, are, are, are still with us. Yeah. They're not, uh, people on health science campus think differently from the people on the main campus. And, we're still working at that. It probably will never be perfectly the same because as you know, I've been at other institutions, University of Michigan most recently, and there is a slightly different culture on the health science campus from the main campus right. there. So uh, I don't ascribe to or uh, aspire to perfect, complete cultural integration. And, and you're not trying to create some sort of a generic template not that all. people will have to follow. This is, after all, a, an institution of discovery, of transformation. Uh, it's an institution of higher education and learning. We so want a vibrant, changing uh, uh, culture, a vibrant, changing institution where uh, conversations ebb and flow and swirl a little bit, and that's what makes for creativity. Diversity in all its aspects. Diversity in all its aspects. Uh, one assumes that, that these were people who represented each of their communities. It they were representative of their communities. They had a clear track record of uh, commitment to the university. They uh, had Accept, by accepting the invitation, mm -hmm. said they're willing to give their time. At any rate, that, that large group resulted in a uh, strategic plan that has served us very well now for three and a half, four years. It's a, we, I'm still very proud of it, and it's worked very well. However, six or seven months ago, we came to realize that the world had changed dramatically. Our value system didn't change, our mission didn't change, our vision didn't change, but the world had changed we said it's time for us to revisit 
recalibrate, we say here, our strategic plan. So now you're going through your own change. You've, you've made plans and you're looking at your plans, plans that, you, that you've brought, in, brought into fruition and you're becoming your own critic in yeah, a sense. That's true. And what we have said, however, and it almost harkens back to what we were speaking of earlier, after some deliberation and thinking, we said, we don't need to change our mission statement. Our mission stays the same. We don't need to change our value statement. Right. That stays the same. We don't need to change our vision statement. What we do need to change is how we in react to the external world yes. in order to, quotes, stay relevant. And uh, so we're doing that. Large numbers of people, literally hundreds of people have been involved in this, students, uh, community members again, faculty members, of t uh, so important of course, uh, administrators, provosts, deans, uh, and others have been involved in uh, over the course of the last four or five months now. And uh, we're coming to a place, I think, where we will be able to bring this uh, forward to our trustees. And we've seen some of the debates. I mean, we've seen, a as you bring together people, individuals stand up and become critics of not yeah. only uh, other people's work, but also their own previous thinking. Yes, indeed. But I want to just go back to your question. What about the perfect balance of top-down planning and bottoms-up planning? Uh, there needs to be some of each. It is, to, you know, we live in a difficult world, difficult economic times. The state of Ohio has some, uh, some grave issues uh, related to uh, revenue. And uh, bringing costs under control and making pr decisions about prioritization is it almost never works from a grassroots bottoms up approach it takes a, a balance of of uh, uh, trust a trusting top down bottoms up uh, relationship to uh, deal with that those issues and so a planning principle that we have is that we need to be narrower and deeper universities have tended to be a mile wide and an inch deep and 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 we believe that for this university to excel and to reach its full potential, that we need to be distinctive and choose some areas of distinction. And that to do that, Mark, requires a trusting balance of top-down and bottoms-up uh, uh, colloquy. Let's talk um, a little bit about the areas where you think deeper and focus is uh, at, at, at a point where there is some consensus. Yeah. I would be delighted to do that. There are three. Before I say that, before I enunciate those three, however, let me say this, that I want to be careful that no one construes my comments to suggest that there are three areas of excellence and 27 areas of mediocrity. That's not what I'm <laughs> yes, saying. Yes, yes. What there are is 27 areas of excellence with two or three peaks that truly out that stand out, that tr truly distinguish us. So we have begun, and that's a tough order, of course. We have uh, uh, designated thus far three centers of excellence. Interestingly enough, we have uh, uh, submitted those for approval to the state. The state system has asked also for us to designate uh, centers of excellence, and we have done so. Those three are in, uh, roughly speaking, individualized medicine, uh, photovoltaics and other forms of uh, advanced uh, solar and renewable energy, and uh, three in transportation, geography, logistics, supply chain management. Th those are fairly broad, but e in each of those areas we have special world-recognized uh, expertise. As you probably know, we have uh, are probably the top one or two in the country in terms of the uh, uh, chemistry and physics of yes. uh, 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 solar energy capture. We have rapidly growing and uh, that wide recognition in the area of uh, genetically individualized medicine, biomarkers, uh, uh, genetically determined biomarkers that right. allow people to uh, characterize their own individual health system or have it characterized for them. And uh, we have, uh, partly because of our geography, a, a tremendous investment and expertise in uh, transportation and logistics and supply chain management. I just remind you that uh, Toledo is on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Yes. It's at the intersection of 8090 and I-75. It's at three major railroads uh, merge here. It's, it is 
almost the perfect uh, position geographically uh, for a uh, transportation center. And taking this to, a, to the international stage, because we are in an international yes, world, indeed. we have heard so much and with great frustration about the export of jobs from the United States to other countries. Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about areas where we can actually lead, particularly in the, in the, um, in the energy area, which is so vitally important uh, to this country. Could, could you talk a little bit about the connection between economic development for Ohio, for uh, to the, the Toledo region certainly, but, but for Ohio, and for this area, which, which really will undergo a transformation in the next 50 years. Uh, yet another role is being asked of universities, and that is to be uh, uh, the, the sustainer the, and steward of the community welfare. Of, of community undertakings, not only economic development in the traditional sense of uh, uh, um, growth partnerships or uh, port authorities, but also uh, to uh, speak to the quality of the place, to uh, set the bar for the quality of health care in the community, to build the human capital that draws uh, uh, corporations and uh, uh, either for expansion or or for new s uh, location uh, to make the community a good place to, to live make the economically, a good place to live environmentally. This is an exciting uh, 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 role for universities, ones that I'm deeply committed to. And it also connects beyond uh, research or and uh, what had previously been a narrower definition right. of 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 what universities were about, what research universities were about, into quality of life. It, con it connects into the performing arts, the visual arts. No question It connects about it. into a knowledge of history and a knowledge of, of literature. Absolutely. And the role of the university is no longer to do research and publish in a journal. The role of the university in research is not finished until that research is uh, uh, licensed and uh, uh, commercializable and, and ultimately in production such that it has an impact on, human, on the human condition. The role of the university is not finished when we hand a student a diploma, but is finished only when that student is, becomes a productive member of society, reaping the rewards of that education by being a full societal participant, voting more frequently, uh, enjoying better health. So we have a very expansive view of what universities are and should be. In, to my mind, a, uh, a pretty exciting view, and I am just really proud. You, your introductory question was, why do you want to do this at the University of Toledo? The answer is exactly here, is what it is that the University of Toledo brings to this community and has the opportunity to bring to this community. Dr. Jacobs, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank yeah, you for providing pleasure. your insights. It's a pleasure. Good to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you.